Welcome to a sociological theory lecture on Emile Durkheim's Elementary Forms of the Religious Life. Uh, the copy of the book that my graduate uh, sociological theory students read is, um, you know, the, the original old free press um, Swain translation. Uh, the book is first published in 1915. There's other translations out there, um, but I don't really see much advantage to use them. So uh, this book's um, available widely free online. Um, in this form. So there's a number of different paginations um, out there, so you may have to fuss with it a little bit if you're following along. Um, so I've been making these recordings uh, after the coronavirus uh, pandemic. I actually uh, was vaccinated but came down with, um, with um, COVID about a week and a half ago, and I've been um, uh, waiting to recover and for my isolation period to pass. Um, I've actually attempted this recording several times and keep um, being shocked at my inability uh, to focus. So hopefully uh, we can get through it uh, this time without, um, without much um, disruption. Just, just know that I have felt better and that my brain has worked better than it is uh, right now. So, okay. Um, you know, like... like <laughs> I swear that all of Emile Durkheim's books have the wrong title. Um, you know, the book Suicide is only nominally about suicide. I mean, the content of the book is suicide, but it really is a book about, um, you know, various forms of social regulation and social attachment, identification, and so on. And so it really isn't about suicide as much as, as suicide's this excuse to use. Um, to comprehend, um, you know, social solidarity in, in modern societies. Well, the book Elementary Forms of the Religious Life is uh, only nominally about religion. I mean, the entire book, of course, is about religion, about totemism in particular. But that's not really what the book is. The reason I assign it isn't because I think totemism is important for every uh, student of sociology to comprehend. The reason I assign it is because Durkheim works out in this book um, a social realist uh, interpretation of religion, or to put it another way, um, uh, Durkheim recognizes that there's a kind of an affinity, um, even an overlap, or almost a, a total congruence between um, religion and, and society, okay? So um, I think w the way to start this is with a, uh, an image I drew this like a number of years ago. I think I was literally in a faculty meeting when I drew this out, um, a relatively boring faculty meeting apparently, but um, I, I think it was cleaned up later. But um, I've showed this in class before and I've had a variety of student reactions to it, including um, uh, outrage because this seems sacrilegious, but it really isn't meant to be. Uh, the, the basic idea here is that um, I was trying to capture in a single image the logic of elementary forms of the religious life. So what you see here is, um, is a God figure or a religious figure, a sacred figure, um, and where the face or where the, uh, in, normally where the image of that figure would be, we see a, um, a mirror, okay? And so in essence, um, Religion is the mirror into which society looks to see itself, right? That's basically the shorthand version here. Um, to quote my friend Mark Worrell, um, when, um, when an individual looks in a mirror, they see a self, and when a society looks in a mirror, it sees a god, right? And that is basically Durkheim's argument. That um, societies are real things, uh, assemblies of human beings are real things, and we have real influence on each other. But we often have difficulty, or at least the human mechanism, for whatever reason, has been unable in historic, um, uh, actually existing societies, has been unable to directly grasp, make sense of, hold on to, organize in accordance with a direct comprehension of the power of social forces around us. Hence, they tend to be comprehended in the key of religion, or put another way, it is the uh, imagery of religion that allows a society 
to comprehend social forces. So maybe this little image will do it here. This will come back to this uh, several times. Real simple uh, uh, image, but but whatever a society is, it's an arrangement of human beings in a kind of stable way in which we exchange energy and influence and so on, and um, and the such societies are held together historically uh, by generating something like a sacred collective representation uh, for the society that becomes an image um, and to which the group is oriented with negative rights and positive rights, more on that later, and that it's, it's those rights and the, um, the calling together or the pulling together of the actually existing group of, of social members, pulling them together for the purpose of honoring and uh, feeding and sacrificing to the collective type, that that becomes the mechanism uh, by which this society um, reconstitutes itself over time. All right? So um, so I wonder if we couldn't um, just jump into um, like a few ideas here. Okay. So here's sort of like summary notions I would like you to have of the book as um, we move through it. So first of all, uh, the first idea is that society is a reunion. Okay, now there's a couple of points in, in the text where Durkheim makes this claim. Um, pay, probably the cleanest one is on page 265 of the uh, edition that I have. Um, yeah, a clan, as he says, is essentially a reunion of individuals who bear the same name and rally around uh, the same sign. Take away that name and that sign, uh, which materializes it, and the clan is no longer representable and often uh, falls apart. Okay, so a clan is a reunion of individuals with the same name and the same symbol, um, and that it's that name and that symbol uh, that generates meaning and that generates a kind of uh, imaginary guide or imaginary support uh, for the. Uh, gathering together. The second place this comes up is on page 475. Um, now, this moral remaking of a society, right, that that's what uh, a religion is, is the moral making and remaking of society, and it cannot be achieved except by the means of reunions, assemblies, and meetings where the individuals being closely united to one another reaffirm in common their common sentiments. Hence come ceremonies, um, uh, which do not differ from regular religious ceremonies, either in their object or the result. So then he says, you know, what is the essential difference between a, a Christian or a, a, a Jewish uh, a gathering um, or a reunion of citizens commemorating some historical event, right? It, it, it really doesn't matter what the imaginary uh, rationale is to call the group together. It simply is, is called together. So a society, a clan, or any other society is is essentially a kind of reunion. It's kind of like a supper club, right? That, that reassembles, recreates itself, reconstitutes itself. And that religion is the, um, it generates the periodicity or the cycle. Um, it regulates the time and place of these reassembly, um, uh, moments of reassembly, and then regulates what happens uh, when it's done. But religion is, uh, again, to Durkheim, the imaginary support for the reassembling in the real, right, of a society, okay? So number two, religion is the, and there is the imaginary support for, for this reunion. So there's two types of, uh, or two sort of regions of religion that, uh, that Durkheim analyzes, beliefs and rights. So beliefs are the ideas uh, uh, it, that which provides the reason or rationale or explanation uh, for the reunion. And rights are the uh, formulaic recipes, really calls them recipes at one point, that structure the reunion, right, that provide form to it. So beliefs and rights, okay? So, and uh, point three, the force experienced in a religion is real, right? It's a real force. Um, and there are sections in the book, which we'll uh, get to shortly. Um, it really, it's in book two, uh, chapter six, um, is where he really begins walking through Ma, the concept of mana, um, you know, the, the Melanesian, Polynesian notion of mana, um, the um, Plains Indian notions of Khan, Orenda, right? Um, these are um, uh, sort of 
tribal ideals or clan ideals of, of, um, of an impersonal, indefinite, all right, moral force, okay, that exists everywhere and that, uh, that can take uh, various forms. But, um, yeah, but that this is a real force and that, these, that some of these tribal societies have actually developed a concept for it. Um, and, um, yeah, so, so it's a real thing, okay? So the group really comes together and generates a force that is real. And the, so the force that we call religious force is, in essence, a real thing. So uh, number four, the symbolic order of language and law, right, which is essentially what a symbolic order is, um, that structures society requires the mediation or requires the support, again, of imaginary religious beliefs and rights, okay? So the symbolic order uh, can't function uh, without an imaginary um, um, uh, form uh, to give it uh, um, uh, sharpness, to give it um, clarity, to give it coherence, right? So um, it, again, with a few exceptions, we have yet to generate a society that has been able to do away uh, with the imaginary mediation uh, and where uh, human beings can directly admit basically the social origin of the force uh, that they feel. So number five, uh, throughout the book um, and throughout all of his books really, Durkheim uh, presents what's what we would call a homo duplex uh, um, model of the human subject in which um, uh, human beings are both uh, personal individuals, uh, selves or souls, and then there's a double a social uh, self or soul as well. And um, in this book, uh, Durkheim argues that society is also double, that there are two phases of social life, a profane first life in which we engage in basically individuated pursuits, economic activity, and so on, profane things. And then there's a second phase of life called sacred life, right, um, in which we are pulled out of the everyday and we engage in, in society as such, right? So the religious realm. So, uh, so both of these sort of phases of life are necessary to the reproduction of a society. Um, and if you did away with the first profane life, you basically starved to death after a time. Uh, and if you did away with the second life, the society would lose its form, its clarity, its structure of values, and they would go away. So both of these phases then are necessary to the production and reproduction um, of a society. Okay, the next point. Uh, there is, again, just to really make this clear, there is a real presence. And I'm going to use that in a, in a kind of, um, let's just, let's, let's use it in the, in, in, in the sense of Jacques Lacan, that, um, if, that the symbolic order is the structure of language and law, the imaginary is essentially the structure of, of um, really of objects in, in, in the world, including the important objects that we relate to, um, like um, you know the objects of desire and so on. And then the real is the world of pulsations and um, uh, you know again kind of you know the things that are anchored in um, in so, sort of like the natural world, to put it roughly. God, I don't like any of that that I just said. But there is a real presence of social force, right? That social forces um, are real things and that they are strongest and felt most strongly during times of what Durkheim is going to call collective effervescence. So effervescence is an in interesting term. It means fever, fever, collective fever. So the basic argument is that people get together into groups and their moral temperature is increased. And uh, again, the, the, these are um, rules of, um, of uh, collective effervescence that come from uh, a, a, a chapter in my book on NASCAR with, with Bill Swart. But basically, we argue there that the greater the number of individuals, the greater uh, the moral force that's generated, the greater the concentration of those individuals, the more that they're compressed together. So it's sort of like like you know, like fusion energy or something, or fission energy. That when you when 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 you concentrate uh, the fuel rods together, they throw off more, um, uh, you, know, um, you know, electrons, and that those things then cause much more dense uh, reactions, right? So the reactions increase with the greater the number of individuals, the greater the concentration of those individuals. 
the greater the agitation, the third thing of those individuals means excitation or the emotion of those individuals. And then finally, the greater the focus of the group uh, upon clear, sharp, um, 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 you know, strongly stereotyped sacred collective representations, right? The more the focus is maintained upon something very clean and clear, the greater the force generated, all right? But the big point from Durkheim here, when people come together in an assemblage, they generate forces. Those forces aren't present when the individuals are, are separated, and that force is real, and it's generally imagined in the register uh, of religion, okay? The next point, trauma and wounding is everywhere in Durkheim's book, right? So the basic idea is trauma is, is, is wound, right? It's, it's, the, um, uh, it's Greek for wound. Um, and so what happens in uh, many of the religious rituals that Durkheim writes about is that there's a, so that, 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 that wounding, psychological wounding is somatized that the um, psychological feelings of, of woe or dread or sadness, or joy even, um, are externalized um, uh, through some process of wounding. So there's generally a duty or a requirement for uh, the individual to be wounded, physically wounded, right? Uh, so, and, and that makes the trauma uh, of the group or the presence of the group real to its members. So psychological trauma or individual experience is externalized um, onto something physical, projected onto the uh, the wounding that's going on um, it, it, again it becomes object objectified the, the the individual experience of a, of a trauma is socialized through this process and um, and therefore um, that that wound is subject to the power of the social the control basically the real presence of the imminent power of the group itself so when someone dies, which is going to be sort of the biggest trauma that Durkheim's going to talk about, um, the psychological trauma of the individuals who experience the loss of the uh, of the loved one who's died, um, that the, that that personalized, individuated uh, psychological wounding is overwritten by a social duty to mourn. And that the mourning um, isn't something that's individually scripted; it is socially scripted, and the wound that one feels, as again, is etched into the body of, of the mourner, right? And so, it, it again that the, the, psycho the psychological impact of events then become transformed or transmuted in um, in these religious rites into a social uh, phenomenon instead, right? So, in some ways, if society is a reunion. Society is also what we would now sort of recognize as um, the response of um, complex post-traumatic stress disorder. When you look at the round of activities in a totemic society, these individuals are, are subject to an incredible array of, of intense uh, social rights that wound them over and over again, right? And so the, what society does, knowing that there's a response to trauma, um, and, and that that society essentially socializes that response to trauma, and then uses those traumatic moments as mechanisms to build, uh, uh, you know, the members of a society. Right? Okay. So trauma and wounding are everywhere here. The somatizing of social force. All right. And then lastly, the work of society, the profane first life, economic uh, primarily. Um, is centrifugal, right? It's a force that tends to um, uh, pull a society apart, uh, cause it to flee, right? It's, uh, it's diffuse, it's individuated, it's technical. Um, and so the members, um, yeah, so, and that weakens or dissipates the sacred, the force of bondage, the, the central pedal forces that pull a society together. So those sacred social values get diffused, they get weakened, as the individuated process of the first profane life occurs. And sacred time, sacred moments are the, the religious realm is the way that the society then is reconstituted, a reunion is held, a renewal is held, a, um, a refreshment is held that again, reassembles the society and then re-energizes uh, the collective representations that the society has, okay? 
So I think those are um, uh, sort of a good, a good beginning point uh, to working our way uh, through the book. Okay, so um, let's see here. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. All right, so at the end of the book, Durkheim, um, page 462, Durkheim lists basically the essential elements of the religious life and um, that, uh, that he analyzes here. So these are the kind of um, master concepts that you'll need uh, in order to make your way through the book. So the, first of all, the essence of the religious life is the, the great fundamental absolute categorical division between the sacred and the profane. Okay, so what is the sacred and the profane? Well, the sacred, as we're going to talk about, is simply something that is set apart, a thing that is set apart. The profane is the world of everyday life. The sacred is the world of things set apart. Okay, and so the profane world is ordinary time, space, the practical, informal, workaday life, economic uh, labors, uh, largely individuated, diffuse activity, right, routine, routine activities. And in, in the profane world lives largely outside of the moral order. I mean, it isn't that these moral interdictions don't exist. It's just that the profane world is one that is um, that, that has a kind of technical logic to it rather than a moral logic to it. All right. The sacred, however, is a world that negates the profane and pulls people uh, in a society together into uh, a, a separate world, right? Okay. So maybe we can do it here with this one. So phase one of society is the profane world of ordinary profane time, space, activities, and social relations. Phase two is where something sacred uh, is set apart and uh, with negative rights. Okay, so the thing that's set apart is maintained in its separateness with uh, things that Durkheim calls negative rights. Freud calls them taboos, um, which is probably a cleaner term. Um, but there's taboos of all kinds, purifications, uh, you know, uh, pollution uh, rituals, cleanings, uh, initiations, etc. That all of these kind of activities are used to keep the sacred thing apart and separate from the profane world. And then once that thing that is sacred is created, then that thing created as sacred and set apart um, has to be uh, related to in some way. So religion is the set of negative rights that create the sacred and then the set of positive rights that allow for the group to orient itself to the sacred, feeding it, you know, uh, taking care of it and so on. Yeah, so that's what the sacred, all right, is. Okay, so again, if you were to just do this in a quick picture, we'll come back to these images over time. These are the worst drawings I've ever done. I really have been ill. Um, so totemism then, uh, negative rights and positive rights. Um, we're, so a few things, the clan, which is the actually existing social assemblage um, that believes itself to be held together by a totem, um, that a clan always implies another clan. You can never have just one. And so uh, clans um, are each held together or imagine themselves to be unified by a totemic principle totem here a duck and a snake for example and again like in the first world the duck people the snake people can interact and go about their practical technical uh, you know work a day life and then um, they in the moment of the sacred they're drawn into these highly structured ritualized uh, segregated regions where they're um, orienting uh, to the sacred okay so first world you can have all kinds of intermixing the second world not only are the sacred things things set apart that have to be dealt with carefully now the different totems right different sectors and categories and divisions uh, within society become activated and real in some way and and require you know careful processing and careful handling okay all right so just to summarize then uh, the separation of things into sacred and profane is the essential move in, in, in religion, the thing that creates the religious life. The uh, sacred is generally, and at its absolute core, uh, experienced as a force, as a power that's impersonal. It's indeterminate, right? 
Um, however, uh, as societies proceed, um, they tend to uh, provide imaginary uh, uh, form to the real force experienced uh, in, in the group. And that imaginary form uh, takes the, uh, you know, is our souls, spirits, mythical personalities, gods, demons, devils, national and international divinities, and so on, okay? Like, you know, so the individuals really imagine themselves to be oriented not to impersonal forces that are generated by the group, but imagine themselves instead to be oriented to um, gods, demons, devils, uh, 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 divinities, and so on. Now, just to be clear, I always tell my students this. Um, we're not talking about your religion and your God. Your God, um, uh, you know, created the world and created you and created uh, uh, the believers who, who share uh, uh, the belief with you. Your God um, uh, is outside of this analysis. This is a way to make sense of everybody else's God, okay? So, uh, so we know that the different gods and the different belief system and the different rites are incommensurate. So this is a mechanism. Durkheim provides us a mechanism to make sense of other people's gods, right? Just think of it that way, and that, that way you won't... Um, that usually turns down the kind of sense of sacrilege or of, uh, of, of, of uh, forbiddenness uh, that, that believers sometimes feel when they're reading Durkheim. Okay. So, uh, so, again, the force that's generated by a group that's assembled uh, is real. It, it has an impersonal, indeterminate uh, quality about it, that force. But, um, again, societies tend to imagine that force in the form of soul, spirits, mythical personalities, gods, demons, devils, national and international divinities, or totems, as they're analyzed here. So, uh, there are uh, the, the sacred, the totem, the spirit world, the God uh, is set apart through negative rites, and there's a, so a negative cult is simply the culture or the kind of set of procedures and processes and rites and, and the group itself uh, that uses all kinds of ascetic practices and purification practices and uh, taboo practices uh, to keep the sacred separate. And then once separated out and the group is assembled for the purpose of keeping the sacred sacred, then there's all kinds of positive rites rights of oblation, gifting, rights of communion, sacrifice, uh, imitative rights, commemorative rights, uh, rights of expiation, um, um, that, that these different kind of rights structure the way that the group orients itself once in the presence of the sacred. Gives a group something to do as it's rejuvenating itself, refreshing itself, re-experiencing again the reality of the force uh, that the group itself generates. Okay. All right. So does that make sense? So again, to Durkheim, we'll just kind of get back to this image then. Uh, to Durkheim, the logic of the book is that human beings come together. This group of people down here have come together and they are generating real surplus social power, moral power, force. And that force historically has been experienced in the imaginary form of a religious figure, a totem, um, uh, a demon, a god, what have you. And so the, um, the collective representation, we use the technical term that Durkheim uses, of the uh, god, totem, spirit, is uh, also the collective representation of the group itself. So the group sees itself, can uh, imagine itself, individual members can imagine themselves uh, to be part of the group that is structured by the totemic principle or by the collective representation. It's a mechanism to keep the, um, um, the, you know, the imagination of the members focused upon um, um, the activity uh, needed to generate. When I teach this book in class, I use um, a model that I, I, I sometimes call the pelvic flashlight model um, to help students sort of visualize uh, Durkheim's arguments. I'm going to walk you through that really fast now. Um, so the big idea here is that uh, that to Durkheim, um, the first world activity or first life activity, the profane world of individuated action, um, 
takes place without a full assemblage of the society uh, in, uh, in real presence in front of us. So that means that we, as members of society, uh, in order to be useful to society, have to essentially act in accordance with the commands and duties that society requires us uh, to perform. So what society wants of me, what the big other wants of me, needs to be the fundamental uh, um, um, driver of our action in everyday life. So, you know, in Lacanian uh, uh, sociological theory, um, you know, the the subject often uh, um, identifies with the desire of the big other. So what the big other wants of me is also what I desire, right? If you're well interpolated as a subject, there you go. I want what the big other wants uh, of me. And so we desire, right, out into the world with an imagination, uh, the things that the big other wants. Okay, so this is psychological projection, right? This is my drawing I've used for years of psychological projection where um, the world itself gets uh, sort of effaced or overwritten uh, 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 by the uh, projection outward of our own desires. And here I've got the uh, location of the, um, of the projector uh, somewhere around, uh, you know, like the belly button of the individual, okay? Somewhere uh, uh, um, near the pelvis. So, so that's uh, so when you're projecting the world out there is sort of um, a screen onto which the internal uh, desires are being uh, projected outward. Okay, so the idea that I want that I have students uh, have is this. So in everyday life, so imagine that all of us have a moral flashlight attached to our um, uh, belly button, and that that flashlight has been charged by society and it lights up the world for us with uh, with socially sanctioned values. And so we go about our individuated activity in profane, ordinary time, space, activity and social relations. We go about our everyday life activity, um, you know, shining our, uh, you know, guided by the light of our internalized uh, values, right? Okay, two things happen. When we're individuated and diffuse and uh, centrifugal, um, we're not all facing the same way. We're going about our activities. And so the entire sort of world, so imagine a group of people, each of whom has a broad flashlight of various brightness, um, and, and all of these flashlights are shining in a, uh, in, in, in a different direction. If you're in a room with a bunch of people, all of whom are shining their flashlights in different directions, the entire room gets kind of lit by this kind of vague um, um, uh, uh, glow, okay? So we can see each other, we can do our everyday tasks, the profane world, okay? Durkheim argues, though, that over time, the values uh, that had been charged by uh, society um, wind down in the same way that batteries deplete, right, and need recharging. So uh, Durkheim argues that phase two, the sacred time, is the time when societies come together, a society reconstitutes itself, reassembles, in order to recharge the um, moral flashlights that guide conduct, right, and hold the society together. So there's a thing set apart, a totem here, right? And that, um, it, you know, and there are all kinds of, again, taboos and purifications and pollution rituals and so on that keep it separate. And then all kinds of positive rites that are engaged in to feed and care for uh, the totem once assembled. Imitative rites and all kinds of things. Okay, so what happens in sacred time is that the individuated pursuits cease. You stop working on the Sabbath, right? And you're drawn together in close configuration close assemblage with other members of your group that share the same totem and you concentrate upon it, right? And that concentration then leads you to, um, uh, to shine uh, um, on the totem itself so that the other members of the group and yourself become sort of dark and uh, invisible but the totem itself becomes charged with light. It's, it seems like the real thing in the group. Again, the greater number of individuals, uh, the greater the concentration, the greater the agitation, and the greater the focus upon uh, the totem, the greater the energy that's generated recharging uh, the totemic principle. 
okay? So you get into a group, you engage in sacred rituals and so on, expend a bunch of energy, and that reignites and recrystallizes, reclarifies the totem of the group and the values that are associated with it. And then uh, once those values have been reaffirmed and you've felt the real presence of the society around you that's gathered together, that's had a reunion, in order to uh, um, honor the totem, you can go back again now to the first world activity with a recharged moral flashlight. And, uh, uh, and with again, you can engage in individuated action that's still coordinated with um, uh, social needs because your flashlight has been reconstituted. So these are the two phases of life. Phase one, everyday individuated action, nevertheless guided by an internalized sense of, of social values. And phase two, the sacred time in which the group tightly reconstitutes itself and focuses upon uh, the thing set apart that is then fed and watered and taken care of and so on. And then recharging that, that moral um, uh, flashlight again, you go back out into the uh, workaday world. So the uh, material needs of the society essentially are met here, uh, food, shelter, clothing, uh, what, you know, the, the things that Marx would call value probably, but you're doing economic production and other things here. And uh, so social things are done here, right? Where you're recharging uh, the battery. Okay, so that's the image I have. So I, um, in, in the Totem and Taboo lectures, I use uh, this image um, you know, right here. So a group of people charged together, concentrated together, um, who are lit, apparently, by the uh, radiating energy of a totem, but that totem is lit, uh, it's a reflective surface, and it is actually lit by the moral energy being projected onto it by the group. It is the group coming together that generates surplus energy that then gets externalized, projected outward, onto this objective thing that, again, at least in the imagination, known as a totem. And then once that experience uh, winds down, each individual goes away with a shining moral flashlight into uh, the world of everyday life. Okay? All right. So that provides us then with a kind of um, conceptual map of Durkheim and uh, on the elementary forms of religious life. I'm going to leave it there. And then we'll open up the next video with, um, with a more concrete walk through the book.